Hey, GovCon Giants family. Eric Coffey here, your host of the GovCon Giants podcast. If you are new to our podcast, we interview people, companies, organizations that are all supporting small business federal contracting. So if you or someone that you know is in the arena and you're making it happen, if you have not already been on our show, definitely reach out to us to be part of the GovCon Giants podcast show. So today our guest is Miss Roberta Moore. Miss Roberta Moore started her organization A Mora Incorporated back in 2002. She actually graduated from the 8A program in 2014 and so we're able to draw from those experiences of what it was like to be part of the 8A program back in the early 2000s. But more so than that, in today's episode we discuss how she acquired her first mentor, how she met her second mentor, and then how that mentor gave her a back office. And then from there, she was able to grow her business and start doing OCONUS contracts. That's right, work outside of the continental United States. Stay tuned for this upcoming episode with Miss Roberta Moore. (sighs) My name's Roberta Moore, and the name of my company is Amora Incorporated. Okay. All right. Now, just before we actually turned on the cameras, you were telling me that you were the rainmaker for your company. Yes. Tell us more. Okay. So I was talking about how I didn't have a BD person or I did. I actually paid some BD people, but no one ever brought me any contracts that I was the rainmaker for my company. So everything that came in came through me, although I spent money paying other people to do bd for me if that Uh, makes sense does that make it okay oh yeah makes a lot of sense no absolutely so what would you say to folks out here who's just getting started i mean should they hire bd people should they focus on learning bd themselves what do you think well i think that they should bet their bd people i'm not against hiring bd people i think they should be vetted i also think that people buy from people they like so if they like you, then they're going to want to see you and they're going to want to buy from you. So I think that you should do BD as well as if you're big enough mm-hmm. to hire BD professionals. Oh, interesting. Now, again, when you say when you first got started, so how, take us back to when you first got started. How about oh, that? My. Let's go back yeah. in time. Okay, <laughs> let's go back in time. So Eric, I started in 2002 as a single parent of three boys. And so my youngest is 23 now so that's Uh and he was four when I started so that's 19 years ago (laughs) okay so I started because of necessity and um basically I worked for Naval Surface Warfare Center I was redlined out to the old David Taylor model basin and so I worked there and I had my youngest son and I was like I want to work from home I want to have my own business so on and so forth so I actually resigned (laughs) I resigned from the federal government, yes. <laughs> and so I, re- I know it's gutsy. So I resigned from the federal government and I decided I was going to start this business. Didn't know what I was doing, didn't get anywhere far. And so my ex husband told me, he says, you need to get a job. And I was thinking, well, I have you. Why should I get a job? But, you know, as it worked out, one of my colleagues from NSWC told me that there was a small business that was right in my backyard, not too far from my house. And they were a minority owned company, 8A, and they had a contract at NSWC and that I should go and work for them and manage the contract. Mm. So I went to, for the interview. I got the interview, went in and declined the job and told them that I was an entrepreneur. <laughs> And I still have no money, no contracts. <laughs> so eventually, you are gutsy. <laughs> no, it was terrible. So eventually things got tight. And so my sister said, go back. If they'll hire you once, they'll hire you twice. <laughs> so go back. So I went back. They hired me. And I ended up managing the NSWC contract. So I did the projections. I did the monthly report. I did the hiring. I did all of that for their contract. And so that was the school of business for me. So that's how I really got started is I had to work for a small business. And uh, okay. yeah, so I worked for that small business. So, con- so when you went back, just for clarification sakes, when you went back, you didn't go back to the government. You went to the small business itself. I went back to Okay, Ellen's- and they, they hired you to manage their- <laughs> Yes, okay. they hired me after they offered me the job the first time. And I declined <laughs> saying that I was an entrepreneur. <laughs> right, okay. So you managed the contract for them. Yes, I right. did. So that was the school of business. So, and, 
technically I was a fish out of water because I came from the federal government and went into small business. It was very difficult. It was a whole different animal. Everything specialized in the federal government. So now I'm in a small business and I have to wear all these hats. You have to do BD, you have to manage this uh, contract, so on and so forth. So that was the school of business for me. The company ended up graduating from the 8A program. And I had the bright idea that I was gonna become an 8A so that I could help them and take over 51% um, of their contracts. Well, mm. lo and behold, I didn't get 8A fast enough. <laughs> okay. And so when I submitted my 8A paperwork, they were like, it was putrefied fish or something, get it out of here. They, mm. they, they, yeah, they got rid of it really fast. And then I happened to be at a, con, uh, a conference and everything went electronic. And once it went electronic, I had everything at the push of a button and I was actually certified as 8A. So mm -hmm. I believe that was in 2005 that I okay. became 8A certified. 2003, I became HubZone certified. Okay. And so while I was at that small business, l and &E, I ended up meeting another woman-owned company, a retired colonel from the Air Force. And she had a big contract with DIA in Baghdad. Deborah Scott Thomas, DST. Mm -hmm. And so I offered it to l &E, the company I was working for. They said they did not want to do it, have anything to do with Baghdad. So it was the first right of refusal, right? I gave them sure. the first right of refusal. So Deborah Scott Thomas said, well, we want to work with you, your hub zone. And from that contract, I made enough money to work for a more full-time on my own. So I didn't have to work for l &E anymore. Prior to becoming 8A and HubZone while I was at l &E, they did pay me as a 1099. So they paid me at, under my business eventually. So they were basically my first contract, l &E. I Actually, there's a lot of the things to the story that I really do like, I'm enjoying. And I think people, I wanna just kind of stop it and, and highlight for folks because I, you know, I do know some of the questions that people are asking out there listening to this. One is, you just kind of answered it about them paying you as a 1099er. Um, but at what point did that happen? After I started my business. And after, when did they start paying as a 1099er? When did they start paying me as a Yeah, as a contract. Remember you said they paid you as a contract to L&E? Right. Once I started Amore Incorporated. So uh -huh. I, I told them what my goal was. My goal okay. was to become 8A for them. <laughs> so I wanted oh, I love to it. Exactly. So my goal was so that they could have an 8A that they could right. mentor and that they could keep 50, I mean, 49% of their work. So, so that was so, the objective. So in turn, to help you out, they start paying you as a 1099 and through your company. Exactly. Okay. And, so they were, so they were, they were all along with the plan. They, they, they were going, going along with the plan. Right. Because I presented it. And, and the beauty of it is that I negotiated for them to pay my insurance. <laughs> through the company. I know. That's awesome. <laughs> I needed insurance. I had three boys. I was a single parent. I mean, that was the biggest concern at that particular time. So, right now, now let, let's talk about that. Most people thinking when they have three boys and you're a single parent that you keep a job, not quit a job. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> but your brain says something different. My, exactly. Because I had this, this baby, I had already, I mean, I had two older boys, and then I had this baby. And I was like, I want to stay home with this baby. So the only way I'm going to really be able to do that is I have to work for myself. That is that is, <laughs> that is definitely unconventional thinking. I agree. I agree. And it's um, gutsy. It takes a lot of courage to do that. I mean, I ended up going through a divorce during the process. And my boys were really what made me want to have my own business and really work hard at it because I knew there was no other way that as a single woman, I was going to be able to give them a decent life. So I figured, you know, I have to go out here and, and make it, make it happen for them. And that's what I did. Wow. That's great. I love it. The other part of the story that I want to recap is now this contract that was in back at that with Deborah Scott Thomas. Yes. What was it? What were you doing? Because I mean, again, most of us, when I think about, I, I'm kind of like your first L and E. Like, I don't know about no back that contract. <laughs> I would be a little hesitant also. Right, like, right. Most of us don't know how to work outside of our cities. 
And then you talk about going to Baghdad. <laughs> right. So the beauty of the Baghdad contract is, is that we were building up the infrastructure. So we were doing IT. And so L&E mm -hmm. was doing IT and I was managing a uh, Pentagon contract for, right. for LE at the time. And it was coming to an end. And I had already gotten all those people, uh, top secret, uh, facility clearance. Okay. So it was like, they were asking me like, Roberta, what's the next, you know, gig, what, what are we going to sure. do? And I didn't have another contract in queue for them. So when this opportunity came up, I had somewhere to send them and believe it or not, it was so interesting because I was, I just happened to be at the Homeland Security Conference and it was a guy sitting there and he had his glasses on sitting with his laptop. And I was like, this is the last person. And I said, he looks smart. I'm going to leave my card with him. <laughs> And that's how I ended up with the bag that contract. No. Uh, no. <laughs> yes. So that's how I got that uh, introduction to DST and Deborah Scott Thomas. And later she ended up becoming my mentor and she gave me the whole back office. I mean, so it and a, a EPA contract. I mean, I had my name on the Ronald Reagan in the Ronald Reagan building on the door for EPA. So it was a very lucrative relationship just for leaving that one card with that last guy as I'm walking out the door <laughs> at a conference. What'd you say so, to him? I just um I told him that I had cleared professionals at the Pentagon and that the contract was getting ready to end and I'm looking for somewhere to place them. <laughs> That's what I told him. And and he um, remembered cleared professionals. That was the thing that he needed. I said I had cleared IT professionals. So that's how I ended up getting that phone call. Um, and from there, so we built up the infrastructure, but it was one contact that I had hired on the Pentagon contract who like got me everybody. Like my phone was ringing off the hook because of this one person, this one female. Yeah. And she just had the people calling like crazy. Wow. So I made enough money to leave l &E. <laughs> No, that's great. And that's full good. time for myself. Sure. Wow. 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 That's awesome. No, that's amazing. Uh, you know, actually, th that's one of the questions that people often ask me, and I have it here written down. But it's people always ask me, when is the right time to leave? When you know, when you first go out there on your own and you're still working a job and starting your business as solo entrepreneur. You know, what would, advice would you say to someone? When it, when it, when is the right time to leave your job? I mean, you obviously left be in the beginning, which was. I don't know how that that's it all, but how do you s decide when is it the time to start, you know, devoting uh, more than, you know, 50% of your time on your business, 75% of your time on your business to really help it grow and take off? Well, it's not for the faint of heart. And I don't think I almost want to say it's like, like having a baby. It's never the right time. Right. You know, you're, right. it, this is your baby. It's never the right time. You're going to learn through the process. And right. it's like marriage. Like you don't get married when you're rich. You, you kind of want to build <laughs> unless yeah. you're going to get a, a, a prenup. Right. <laughs> right. I like but, you. Already. <laughs> so, so the thing is, is that it's, it's never the right time. You just have to know that you're ready. And then you take that leap of faith and you, you jump out there and you, you're going to fall. You're going to fail. And I mean, it hasn't been easy. It was very, very difficult. Like I said, I was young. I was young and ambitious, gutsy, you know, like most of my colleagues, they have retired from the federal government or they have retired from the military and then right. they went and started their business. Sure. So they're in the 8A program now. I graduated in 2014 right. and I almost lost my shirt. Like I couldn't keep the lights on. But the thing is, is that I, I, I lived through it. You know, I lived through it. And so it was very difficult and, you know, it's been an uphill battle, but I, I was in it. Like, this is my baby. I started this baby. I have a purpose. And I think that's another thing, having your why. What's your why for doing it? Now tell us about that because um, we don't we don't often hear those stories of I almost lost my shirt and it's what's interesting is in going back and doing the research for my upcoming book Secrets of a GovCon Mind I've realized that since my start of the podcast two of the companies that I had on my show have since closed their doors so tell us about the difficult times because you know 
I haven't had any, many people talk about the difficult times specifically. They've talked about, you know, sometimes when they're starting out and being difficult, but you're saying as business went on and progressed, you're telling us all the up, the up and up. So what happens right. on the down? What happened? How did it start coming down? What changed? Because I know you want, at the beginning, you want some million dollar contracts in the beginning of 05 and, mm -hmm. you know, with your hub zone, you want another million dollars with the 8A and some other stuff. What happened? Right. And that's the point. I think that most people don't talk about, you know, losing your shirt. And and I sort of almost lost my shirt. I actually did. <laughs> I lost my shirt <laughs> and I couldn't keep the lights on. But uh -huh. I say that to say, I remember when I got my first Walter Reed contract, my first sole source from Walter Reed. And I, it was like the Kotar or somebody, they said, yeah, in five years, you won't be around because that is what is indicative of the 8A program. Mm. So you, you do well for nine years. And then after that, you can't stay alive because no, you're not getting sole source. You can't compete in mm. the open market or you haven't prepared yourself to compete in the open market. Then if you get to a, a certain size, you're not mid-size, you're still small and, and you're still, it, it's, hard, it's difficult to compete. So, you know, you're expected to die after the 8A program. So those companies that, that make it through the 8A program, I take my hat off to them because I know how difficult it is. So what I had to do was I had to reduce my infrastructure. I mean, I had to cut back. And that means cutting back on people that are on your overhead, you know, cutting back on your location expense, like your, your office expenses. Right. I mean, there were so many things and it's, it's a difficult process because you don't know what to expect. You don't know if you're going to be able to sustain even the cuts. So what you're saying is during a time where you were in the 8A program, you did, everything was great. Right. right? And then when uh -huh. you stopped out, when you got out of the 8A program was when things started going south. Right. Things started going south. And the thing is, is you think you're doing everything right there. Uh -huh. You know, you can do everything right. You can prepare for graduation. You can, you can prepare to mentor someone else. You can do all the right things. That doesn't mean it's going to work. <laughs> so you have to have a plan A, B, and C, and then they may, you know, none of those may work. And that's what we were talking about prior to the podcast is that, I mean, I was a part of Vistage and one, our chair, he was like, you could be doing all the right things, but you could be leaning against the wrong wall, you know, mm -hmm. you're doing, so it's no magic bullet. You, you have to try, you have to put your best foot forward. And if those things don't work, then you have to be able to rein things back in so that you can stay alive and make those hard decisions. And one of the hardest decisions I had to make was one of our COOs, she helped my children with their homework. And when I had to let her go, my youngest son was so worried about her. <laughs> He was so upset and he was so worried about her. Right. And Eric, I had to tell him that like her house is paid off. You're going to be sitting on the curb. We have these are, necessary <laughs> cuts. <laughs> these are necessary cuts, you know, and people. They how old was how old was he at the time? Ah, uh, let's see. Let's remember? see. I don't know if he was in maybe middle school. Maybe middle I'm just school. wondering what, what what child would be so worried about. the Because the... if this person has grown up with you, like she basically. She was with you but, for what, 10 years? Yeah, she was She was my, my, one of my first contracts at Walk to Read. Okay. She worked on the contract. Then I brought her into the office to work in my office. And she wasn't the COO at the time. So she grew. She worked mm -hmm. her way up. And the house that I live in today, I think she found this house for me. <laughs> exactly. Wow. I think, and I think she went and cleaned out my, my previous, my townhouse. And so she became... Right a part right. of the family and right. you know she was married she had no children she was okay I mean she right. had lived a good life she was okay we weren't <laughs> we weren't but right. but that's what happens and people resent you you know I know that people have probably some more stories about me because of it like well why didn't you just let me take a pay cut I couldn't afford a pay cut I had to cut the bleeding you know I had to I mean what happened how did you did the contracts just start drying up? Well, yes, some of the contracts started drying up. What else happened? One of the good things that 
really saved me was that I ended up getting on a full and open army-wide local tenants contract. And that kind of fed me as the other contracts were drying up. Mm. So that was a saving grace that I was able to do that. But yeah, they started drying up. Some of the the uh, schedules I was working on didn't go through. Some of like you have consultants working with you and you paid them and you never get the contract. And mm. I mean, it was just a lot of things that went on on top of raising three boys. So mm. I'm really thankful for the process. I'm not upset about any of it. I'm thankful that I'm I'm here to have this you know podcast interview with you that we we made it through and we're it's right. still an uphill battle, but we're we're still here the doors are still open and we're still ready to do business wow that's that's a good story <laughs> thank you i thank like you. no i i like i you know again when they when when you read the books they said you can learn some things from success but you can learn a whole lot more from failure and i have a lot of, i was actually taking notes myself and writing down some good points why do you think it is and, and you did give some points about this, but why do you think it is that the 8A companies um, don't make it beyond 8A? I think sometimes you're pigeonholed into certain areas. Okay. I think one of the things is preparing for 8A. I mean, for graduation, that you okay. should prepare for graduation. And, and SBA is really good with that. They want you to prepare for graduation. They try to make sure that you're prepared for graduation. Teaming, because like I said, I was the rainmaker. All of my contracts, I was the prime. Mm. There was like not one contract. If I was a sub, it was very rare and it did not bring me much money. Like it wasn't a big, you know, it wasn't 95% of my revenue. Okay. Right. So the other thing is, is I went at it alone. I mean, like I said before, I was the rainmaker. I didn't have a lot of partners. I mean, and I tried. There were some large companies that sought me out and we tried to win some things together. We did not. It's just, you know, it, it's business. It's a roller coaster. You no. have to ride. <laughs> you, you have to, you know, it goes up. And when it comes down, you have to ride it. <laughs> you're me... screaming going up and you're screaming right, going screaming down. Right, screaming going down. <laughs> Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that's true. You, you did, that's a good, I like that when you scream going up and scream going down. <laughs> you know, that's that's true. That's a very good point. I always tell people, I said, look, winning a contract is very exciting and very terrifying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because yeah. now you you won a contract. Yes, you're happy, but then you have to perform and deliver. Right. Yes. And then that's when it hits you and it's you're like, okay, now mm-hmm. it's time I'll show them up. From my observations the last four years, speaking with people. And hearing what you said about the 8A program, you know, my belief is that while they, they try and do a really good job of the application for 8A, I think the government does a poor job on the education of when is the right time to get into the 8A program. And mm-hmm. you admitted that when you first started, you didn't know anything, right? You came out of the government. Right, right. Okay. And so for me, I think that a lot of the companies that go into 8A, they're told by contracting officers, they're told by PTAC, they're told by all these people that 8A is the holy grail of mm-hmm. getting contracts. And so they never learn how to start a run a business. Mm-hmm. And 8A doesn't teach you how to run business. Well, I think you're absolutely correct. But I think I started, I got into the 8A program at the right time. You because did. Yes, I did. And the reason why I say that I did is because I came out the gate with a contract. Like I didn't. So you, yeah, you were ready to go. You were ready to go. Right. I was ready to go. But but that's why you're also been here for 19 years. Right. Right. I was ready to go out the gate. And so, I mean, I had been marketing to Walter Reed and they had my trifold that I made on my printer at home or in the office. (laughs) sitting on their bookcase and one of the, you know, uh, contracting officers picked it up and called me up and said, you know, so that's how so that you, Yeah, you were right. But we, when, we, when we talk about what the coach are said to you about all the 8As, not, you know, then, then when they graduate losing and not being in business, do you think that's a good, that's that some part of the reason? Like you said. Because they're not ready? or They were never ready, right. They were never ready to be in business in the beginning. Well, I think that the 8A program spoils you. I think okay. <laughs> you're ready to hire. 
you are able to get soul support and things of that nature. So I think it can spoil you. And that if you don't have the right people around you preparing you it, to do the right thing so that when you do graduate, you have these full and open competition, you have these contracts in place that are not 8A. And so uh, small business, full and open, things of that nature, GSA schedule. So I, I just think that, that you know, you can become dependent on right. it. And then when right. it's gone, you know, you're used to living at, you know, a certain standard right. and right. And then now you no longer have that. You have to change things or you have to invest, take your 8A money and invest it back mm -hmm. into your company so that you can build, so you can continue wow. to build. So wow. when you're uh, at your high, but you never know, you know, a lot of times you don't know when, when, when you're not going to be at your high. Cause it, I mean, you know, you could be 20 million and yeah. lose one contract that could be 10 million. I mean, you cut yeah. your company in half, yeah. you lose another one. You're at 5 million. You know, that's a big step. Exactly. That's a big step. So no, those are the things that could happen with government contracting. I mean, to and you could be at, at 1 million and, and get a contract for 32, you know, right. you're at 32 million just overnight. So right. those are the things that happen. And that's the beauty of it. That's why we do it. <laughs> you know, that's, no, why that's, we, that's why we stick with it because you know it, we're it's the good. crazies it's good. we're the crazies we're the crazies <laughs> and it's good when it's good it's right. like you know you you have this this relationship and he's great when he's great and he's bad when he's bad <laughs> <laughs> so it's good when it's good you know okay no no i love it i love it well so now coming out of it how are you able to rebound like um having rebuilding myself new relationships because that's the other thing eric a lot of my contacts are elderly or they they they're deceased i mean so yeah their their great role in government contracting has changed and so people retire it's just so now i'm meeting new people and just kind of redeveloping myself. And I even had the opportunity to be a part of the SBA Emerging Leaders Program. Right. I think that was was huge in 2016. Um, and then I was a part of the Vet Biz Ladies 2019 Genesis cohort. And that was with 29 other business women and entrepreneurs. And so those things are invaluable. Those are the things that help you to keep going, to build new relationships and to just rebuild okay no no I, I, it's great now let's go into some of the things having been in a brown business 19 years can you tell me something that was hard when you started in business that's still hard today oh <laughs> writing proposals <laughs> yeah proposals, I mean, I proposals are tough in the office <laughs> i've done some all-nighters i feel like you know how they said beyonce forgot to eat she was on tour right. Right. and she was just going and going right. i mean i've been on stage like that <laughs> with right. uh, putting out proposals so that whole right. proposal process is still hard i mean you got to get it right Not you got to answer the mail you got to answer the mail <laughs> proposal is tough that proposal yes. is tough that proposal is tough. You mentioned that you were in Emerging Leaders and the Vet Biz Lady cohort. Um, what other training resources have you had along the way to help you in dealing with your ups and downs of being a business? Well, I, I was a part of Vistage. And so what's, what's, I, you keep mentioning Vistage. I don't know Vistage. Yeah, it's an international CEO advisory board. And so like, it, it's huge, but it's nothing like it works for being in business. But I mean, like you get a lot of coaching and all of those things. I was a part of, I think, the Annapolis chapter, but it it isn't what you have, Eric, with GovCon Giants, because it's strictly focused on government contracting. And that's where a government contractor needs to be. He needs to be with you in your organization because you focus on government contracting. Right. Whereas Vistage, they focus on all types of government. I mean, not government, but entrepreneurs from okay, positions. So I, they're to, probably, um, so they're more like my entrepreneurs organization or entrepreneurs network. 
Yes, okay. it's more like okay. that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that was great because it's lonely at the top. You have other people Absolutely. that you can talk to. You know, we get we had to check in. We checked in once a week. We would discuss how we were doing mentally, emotionally, physically. That's, yes. Yeah. All of those. Yes. Things. Yes. So, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and that, and it's more like accountability. Yes. And we would right. rally around each other and, you know, goals for our business and so on and so forth. Right. But um, that didn't help me get government contracts. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. No. So, so that, that, was, that helped you with your sanity of being a business. <laughs> yeah. That helped me with my sanity and I had to pay for it <laughs> handsomely. <laughs> yeah, no, I know those programs are not cheap. They're not exactly. Cheap, exactly. They're not cheap. And so just self-development. The other thing I did that I'm so thankful for is that I started working out. Like mm. I noticed that a lot of people that were in government contracting, they were dying of heart attacks, strokes, mm. and all kinds of crazy things because of the stress level. It's very stressful. Right. So I just started dedicating time to myself. I said, you know, and I wish I had done it sooner. I mean, like when I was younger, I was athletic or you know, that kind of thing. But then I started just working, sitting at my desk, you know, these late right. nights, these right. early mornings, so on and so forth. But once, you know, things started changing, I started just to invest in me, invest in my education. I invested in my health because mm -hmm. that's my motto, health as well. Right. So I really believe that. So I started running Haynes Point and hitting the stairs and you know, the Martin Luther King Memorial, I was running all of that jump rope, all of those things, because it keeps your mind clear and it keeps you young and, and just gets oxygen to the brain and, and helps with so many things, your immune system. So mm -hmm. that, that really, I, I can't, I can't emphasize it enough with women, especially because we carry so much, you know, we're, we're not just running a business, we're running a household, we're doing a lot of other things that, that men don't have to worry about that, that we have, you know, that we carry with us. Now, speak on that same subject matter, how do you feel? Do you feel like you had um, any, any one treated you differently because you're a woman in business? Mm, did, you feel, did you see any I of that feel, or feel any of that pressure at all? I think over time I became, um, I was a little closed. So I just put on my power suit and, you know, I kept my head up and, and I was very close. Like I'm much more open now because I've been around longer and I've had um, some ups and downs and I think it makes right. you more personable. But prior to, I was pretty closed and very just about the business. <laughs> I was just about the business. So okay. with that being the process I don't think people could get close to me and I felt like I had something to hide you know I was a single parent I didn't want people to know my business I didn't want them to know my struggle that look mm. I am competent I'm just as good as anyone else you know maybe I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth and I don't have the background that someone else may have but I'm gonna die trying and I'm, you know, I can do it. I've done it. You know, I have the track record, so on and so forth. So now I think I'm just in a different place and I'm more comfortable with myself. So I feel like women, we have a lot to contend with, but mm -hmm. I also think, and then we're also probably um, misunderstood. Okay. You know, yeah. Sometimes women are misunderstood of why I'm so closed or why I was, you know, because I, I was hiding that I'm carrying this this weight that I have to deal with all these other things. So I don't want you to see that. I just want you to see a professional. I want you to see a businesswoman, and I want you to treat me as such. Right, 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 right. No, that's fair. That's fair. When your business was um, on the downslide, let's say, who were the people that were encouraging and supporting you and what were they saying? Hmm. Or wow. if it's easier, who were the people that were not so encouraging and not so supportive and what were they saying? Is that an easy well, question? I don't really know though. I mean, I'm going to say this. When I first started my business and I was making millions, I remember my mom not realizing that I was making millions, right? She still saw me just as her daughter and it was no big deal. And then I remember when I was going through it and I was so distraught and frustrated, I remember her telling me this to keep going. So I know 
Yeah, so as much as they, you know, your family and others around you may appear not to see your success or, you know, they're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> when you're when you're down they're there for you so i feel like my mom has really been instrumental because um i mean i'm one of eight ah, i'm one of eight i'm the only one that that you know has a college degree i'm the only one that started a business so you know i think that she was proud you know she was proud and she was willing to do anything she could do to help me i remember one time i was getting sued for a million dollars and I could not sleep. So I called my I know mom at like two or three in the morning, right? So my mom used all these choice words to talk about the people that were suing me. And <laughs> I fell asleep. I fell asleep. So my mom could not give me any business advice. I right. mean, I, I mean, she didn't have anything, but it was just shared, shared right. compassion, shared understanding. And so after I hung up with her, well, while she was talking, I realized I'm just going to call my lawyer in the morning. <laughs> but she calmed me enough to go to sleep and to deal with it the next day. So I say it's, it's the unlikely people that right. it's not going to be someone who's it's going to, you know, that's been doing it and they understand they, you know, they don't know it's your road. You have to travel it. So it's always going to be different for each one of us. The thing that I did, you probably won't do, but just knowing that you can do it. Well, I, I, was, sued, I, was, sued, I was sued for the same thing before. So I've been there before. <laughs> I know it's like not to sleep. And I know, in fact, um, I wrote my first book while going through my lawsuit. Oh, wow. <laughs> because I, I said, well, I guess this government contract thing isn't gonna work out. <laughs> so I guess I'll write a book. <laughs> Right, right, tell right, my right. story. No, it was it was actually a private contract, but I I, I figured construction. I said, well, I guess I'm not good in construction, so I'll uh, work <laughs> on writing a book. And so oh, I work, actually worked on a book, my too. first book in that time. Yeah, so I have to write my book about it now. <laughs> you need to write your yeah. You should write your book. I mean, you've never heard people say writing a book is therapy. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, actually, it's like journaling, you're getting your thoughts and putting them on paper, and you're not holding it inside. But the thing about that, Eric, is, is that I have like 10 million books. <laughs> so there's, I mean, you could write the book about that situation. So you, write the book about, there's so like you better get look, <laughs> You better get started then and now. <laughs> that's going to make me money. Yeah, you got all you, these you books get, out here. You, you asked me about what are some of the things that people get when they leave my show. You, you become encouraged that you could do other things. You could do your business and work and then also do this other stuff on the side. So wow. I think I'm a pretty good example of that where I do contracts, but then, you know, I do this other stuff and give back and help people on the side. So you can write your books. Yes. And you're well, good at it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have, I'm going to hold you to it. We're going to make that our uh, resolution for you to work on your first book. Yes. How's sir. that? that <laughs> well, once you give me the title, then I'll start working on right. it. <laughs> well, we wrap this up. We're going to wrap this one up and then I'll help you with a title. We'll, okay. we'll do that. Well, well, what's today? The 19th? Okay. Yeah. All right, we'll do that. We'll 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 hold you to it. All Sounds right. like a plan. So uh, we talked about exercise. We talked about eating healthy. Uh, your mom helped you. Let me um ask you something. So what would you change if you had to go back and do it over again? Ah, I would um perhaps change my attitude, thinking that I wasn't going to be able to live through it, because mm -hmm. at the time you don't think you're going to live through the things that you go through. And then you're on the other side of it and you're like, wow, I made it through that. So I think I wish I knew what I know now that, that you're gonna make it through this. But one of the things that I noticed, Eric, is, is that it helped me to be, to think outside the box. Like I learned so much and I was able to do so much more because I had to deal with the difficulties that you don't think that you can do it. Like they say the mother of invention is necessity. Mm -hmm. Like, so I, I had to become inventive or creative. Right. I agree with you, you know, a thousand percent. I just have a hard time. How do we explain that to other people who've never been through it? Uh, right. Well, how, do you, how do you, how do you get, how do you have someone become at ease with the so-called failure? I think you have to tell your story. I, and I think that that's therapy. Like even me talking to you about it has been therapy for me. 
And I think that sometimes if you have a safe place where you can tell your story and be vulnerable, so to speak, and allow yourself to get it out of how you feel, because it's natural to feel those things. And so I think if, if you have a safe place where you can talk about it to those who've experienced it with no judgment, mm -hmm. because that's the other thing, the judgment zone. So mm -hmm. if you feel like there's no judgment, we sign a non-disclosure, you're not gonna repeat it. <laughs> You know, you can't repeat this. <laughs> right, right. What about the people that, again, they're afraid, right? They're fear, of, fear of failure. Forget the failure. They haven't even failed. They're afraid oh. to do to do something because of the fear of failing. What do you say to them? Um, well, maybe you shouldn't do it then if you're that afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Just let it go. Don't let it go. Forget it. Don't even do it. Just let it go. No, I'm, I'm horrible. No. That's, that's terrible. But no, that's not, I, no, I mean, look, I tell you all the time, Hey, look, maybe you're not cut out for this. I, I don't right. know. You know, and, I mean, and that I, was said to me, that was actually said to me when I was going through it, they said, well, maybe government contracting isn't for you do something else. And, 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 you know, that's, that's something to think about. That's something to think about. And it didn't come from a bad place. It right. hurt, but it, it was true that maybe, you know, you have to, give me some other ideas. In other words, they were saying, I'm going to give you some other ideas. I didn't ask for the ideas, but, <laughs> but they're like, I'm going to give you some other ideas. And so, I mean, like, how did we get here? You know, how did we get to government contracting? Like if you ask the little girl or a little boy, what do you want to be when you grow up? Are they going to ever say, I want to be a government contractor? No, no. you're not going to say but that. I, hope, I, I do hope to change that one day, but not today, no. Right, right. That's not the first thought. I mean, no. we have to go to the schools and, you know, on career day, talk about it so that they right. can understand. Right. Because that's why I ended up getting into government contracting is because of exposure. Had I not been exposed to a minority owned business and worked for them, that I would have never started as no, a government. Same contractor. here. Same here. No, absolutely. However, I, you know, I have the uh, utmost belief and sincerity that our government needs us more than ever now. They need yes. good people to come into the space. And so that's, that's one of my uh, reasons for continuing to spread the word and the education. Um, mm -hmm. Because despite all of the turbulence that you've experienced, the, the, the majority of these companies out here, Fortune 100 companies are feeding off of government contracts. Right. <laughs> So there's something good about it. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. There's a and, lot. And, and a lot of people, uh, a lot of corporations have started their organizations like Nabisco off the backs of government contracts like Palantir, okay, SpaceX. So these organizations were funded, supported, and built, turned into major, you know, international companies because of U.S. government contracts. You're absolutely correct. And over and above small business contracting is in steadily increasing. Mm -hmm. We exceeded $130 billion, 2019, 2020. And that's more than an NFL and the NBA combined. Wow. So for me, I think that it's, I, I don't think you can ever say enough about government contracting um, because if we get the right people in here, we get, and we start educating the kids in the schools, then we can attract top talent into the space, into this field, and to continue to help our government improve and do all the wonderful things that it does for its citizens. Yes, and Eric, working for those companies help. That will help a lot to build up their experience so that when they do decide that they wanna go into government contracting, that they have that experience, they, worked for a fortune 500 company they've seen government contracting working you know they've seen the intricate parts of it i'm going to change the subject it's a question i've been asking recently that has created some unique answers okay uh, if you've heard my podcast you've probably heard me ask this recently on a newer episodes name your happiest purchase that you made recently from amazon Okay, so listen to this. Okay. I am the Amazon queen. <laughs> See, I, didn't I know mean, that. like with the pandemic, I absolutely don't go outside, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. 
Okay. And so Amazon delivers everything. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, oh my goodness. I ordered a, a phone case for my new iPhone 12 okay. Pro Max. Uh-huh. I ordered glasses. I ordered food. <laughs> I ordered a, a, a holder for my um my cell phone and for Zoom okay. meetings and <laughs> everything. Everything. Yes, everything. There's nothing that I haven't ordered from Amazon. <laughs> You know, what's interesting is that uh, it's funny you say that I, you know, I moved recently this year and I've been ordering stuff from Amazon and I'm so annoyed with all these boxes now I have. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, yeah, right. no, how could you possibly be partly because imagine you have to drive your car, you right. have to go into the store, you have to bag it or let them bag it. Then you have to carry it out, put it into the car, no, drive true. it home and bring the box or the bags mm-hmm. into the house. As opposed no, to they- landing on your doorstep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So and my like, dog is but- barking like crazy and they run because <laughs> they're scared to death because <laughs> I'm a big dog. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's the best thing since sliced bread. Right. Wow. 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 You know, it's interesting. We didn't even talk about no, Amazon is wonderful. That's why they're, you know, they're worth I mean, whatever. I'm going to show you. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> See? There you go. No, I, I mean, look, everything here, my microphone. Right, here, right. Look, like, you know. look at this thing. <laughs> yeah, my camera, all my lights, everything here. Is, yes. So uh, now, <laughs> there you go. Uh, you're in the healthcare space. What other industries, sectors are you in? Healthcare services? Mainly staffing. Services? Mainly staffing? Okay. staffing, yes, IT staffing, administrative staffing. Okay, um, and what kind of things are you looking for now? Like what kind of, what areas are you in? What, where do you want to go? How, you know, how do you, how do you want to expand your brand and reach? Well, I really, I mean, out of all the things I've done, healthcare has been my bread and butter. That's okay. the one thing that stuck with me. Healthcare staffing? Yes, healthcare staffing. And I talked about locum tenens, which is temporary physicians. That's temporary physicians. So we've sent them all over to all of the military treatment facilities to, you know, VA hospitals everywhere. Mm-hmm. The one thing that I really want to tap into is travel nursing. It's a billion dollar industry and there's mm-hmm. only two companies that have half of that. <laughs> there's two, yes, there's only two companies that have half of it. And so um, I really want to work the travel nursing a little more. I had a subcontract with one of the bigger companies doing travel mm-hmm. nursing. So building up my database on travel nurses and also providing the lodging. Because when I was working with the doctors on locums, I would ask the uh, facilities, well, do you have a place they could stay? Because we have to provide housing, you know, per diem and all of those things. And that's the same case with travel nursing. So I really want to tap into travel nursing. We have a couple of our students in our GovCon EDU program that are staffing and one in particular work with nurses. Really? Yeah. 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 And we've done, we, behavioral health is, is huge. Mm. Um, that's a huge thing. We've done forensic psychologists. Yeah. yeah and, and the behavioral health, I really, I mean, that that's close, near and dear to my heart. Yeah, let's talk offline about the behavioral health. I have some experience in that area. Okay, sounds like a plan. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, now, so you you went through your ups and downs, you came back around, and you, you said you loved the experience. What do you say to the people listening? What do you say to the new entrepreneur listening? That's thinking, I don't know if I want to go through that, you know, or maybe oh. that sounds like fun, right? Is it fun? Is it not fun? I mean, you know... I, it depends. Was do it worthwhile? Do you think it was worthwhile? Do you think it was oh, worth it all? Yes. I could, I was a, a stone throw away from my children. My office was like five minutes from my house. My children's school was five minutes from my office. I mean, like, basically, I'm being facetious, but I could hear my children. Like, I could get to the school. I could get to my house. I, I mean, I was hands on with my three boys. So, and sometimes I had to put hands on my three boys, but, but I was definitely hands on. And so I have no regrets. It got me to raise my three boys. And I think it, it was worth it. It was worth it. Even the down was worth it because it brought something out in me. And it taught me 
that it's not all about business. It's about relationships. It's about family. It's about, you know, just giving back. It's mm -hmm. more than just government contracting. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really about those relationships that you build along the way and what you learn. And like, I, I wouldn't take it back. I wouldn't take it back. Right. Yeah, I think it's about the experience. Mm -hmm. um, and for someone who's interested and in thinking about it, you have to do it when it's ready, when it's the right time for you. You know, I mean, you can't decide, oh, I'm going to do it because Roberta did it and she was successful and she lived through it. No, because if you don't live through it <laughs> and, and, you know, don't, you know, I don't want you to say, well, she did it. Everybody's story is different. And so government contracting is awesome, especially for minorities. I think it's a great place for minorities. I am a product of, of the government, of the government's programs. And it's been very good to me. And without those programs, I wouldn't be here today to right. speak with you on this podcast. And that, that is one thing that I always tell people. This, for me, I have not seen any other programs like this in the world, right? In any field, in any industry that supports small businesses. And I've traveled to other countries and mm -hmm. people said, you have what? You got a right. program where you go, like they say, what do you have? And they just don't have this in other countries in the same form, shape, capacities where they actually promote small businesses, promote entrepreneurship. Like you said, even, even if, you, if it's for just nine years, it's still, yeah. I mean, nine years is a long time. You had mm -hmm. a lot of opportunity to make whatever kind of money you want to make in that time frame, right? And to build whatever type of organization you want to build. So you, you know, but you had a choice, you had the option. Right. And that's what I say. Like, even when I was going through it, I said, no one can take that from me. No one can take those nine years from me. No one can take the 19 years from me. You know, it wasn't all peaches and cream, but it's my story. It's my experience. It's my journey. And no one can take that from you. Now, before you started working for the government, can you tell us like an odd place that you worked at before an odd job? Maybe in high school or college? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so in high school, I had so many great jobs. <laughs> I get to only say one. <laughs> Whatever you like to share. Okay. Just, we, want, we want to make you more normal. Oh, okay, so let me tell you. I worked at Roy Rogers. What's that? It's like they sell fried chicken and okay. biscuits and all of that. Okay. So they're out of business. Okay, so I worked at Roy Rogers and they used to make this strawberry shortcake and they would put a biscuit at the bottom of it and then ice cream and then <laughs> they would put the strawberries on top. It was the best thing ever. So I worked there. I also worked at the grocery store at Super Fresh. And so I was really good. I was a cashier. Uh -huh. And I was the best, like I could get you through my line really, really fast okay. and bag your groceries really, really fast. Right. So if I ever go to the grocery store, I'm always like, these people, they just can't do it. <laughs> and then when it's time to do self-checkout, I'm not that good. <laughs> but back then I was really, really good. So I did that. And then I worked at Rib Runners on Columbia Pike in Arlington, Virginia. Uh -huh. And it was a barbecue place. So they would just like deliver your your ribs to you. You call in and they would deliver them as well as you could like just come in. It was like, like I said, a carry out. So you could come in to the window. Like Uber Eats. Order. It was Uber Eats yeah. before they had Uber Eats. <laughs> yes, but the beauty of it is I was in high school when I worked there and I was running the place. Like I knew how to cook. I knew how to answer the phones. I knew how to do so much like while I was at Rib Runners. So that was like, and then I even helped the owner's son opened up a rib runners in, oh man, I want to say Springfield. It was in Springfield. Mm. So I helped him with that store, you know, showing him how we do everything on the, in the store in Arlington. Mm -hmm. And then from there, let me tell you where else I worked. I worked at the uh, Macy's. I worked at the Macy's oh, nice. in city when it first okay. like opened. Yes. I was in high school then too. <laughs> I know. So I had some pretty good jobs and I'm yeah. proud of it. I was good at everything I did. <laughs> no, well, and that, that's, I'm, that's probably why, like you said, you're still working today. You had good work ethic. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. If you weren't doing this, what do you think you'd be doing? Well, my kids say that I would be a good motivational speaker. <laughs> and this is the funniest part about it. 
that so my middle son thinks I'm great at motivational speaking. So my youngest son thinks I'm horrible because all I do is give him a motivational speech, but I don't help him get anywhere. <laughs> Okay, now what do I do? Now what do I do? <laughs> right. I'm like, I've kept you up. Now go do it. <laughs> I like that. He's like, you'd be great voice. But okay, now you got me motivated. Now what do I do next? <laughs> exactly. And my oldest son doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> He's like, what are, they, what are their ages now? I heard no one was oh 24. Oh my goodness. If I tell you, I will have to kill you. <laughs> well, you said one was 24. So that means. So, you know. I mean, it's seven and five years between the, the baby. So I'm not telling. <laughs> uh, okay. And he's 23. So that, get that. <laughs> the youngest okay. is 23. <laughs> 23. Okay. All right. So yeah. we'll let people do the math on that. Right, 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 right. We'll let them do the I math. started my business when I was 30. Nice. So you, I, you, but I, you jumped out, you jumped out there. Yeah, I was a little disappointed too. I wanted to be like, I started in my twenties. I wanted to be able to say that, uh -huh. but I was 30 years old when I started my business. That's okay. That's no. it's okay. I mean, it, it's okay, but I wanted to, I was like, ah, <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> but that's, that's, I think that's great that you were thinking back then. Did you, did you always want to start a business or that just came out of necessity? Like you said. Um, I think. I did, but I, um, like I said, I came from a family of eight and, you know, my mom was able to take care of us and it was very difficult. It was very difficult, but the mm -hmm. beauty of it is, is that although we were poor, we lived in Arlington, we didn't own our own home, but I was in a good education system. And so mm -hmm. I think that helped me out a lot because my mom wasn't in a position to help me with homework. I mean, like I never had a parent sit down and help me do my homework. And so I think that the educational system in Arlington was so great because I believe like I was in English as a second language so that I could learn to read <laughs> so that I would be able to read. Yes, because you didn't have the parent at home. You know, like what I did with my children, they were able to read at a very young age right. because I was involved. Right. My mom was a um, a homemaker. I mean, she took care of the home. We were clean. We were well taken care of, well fed, and all of that. And then, you know, you go to school <laughs> and you learn. Right. And so, and that. So, I'm thankful that I was in that environment because I think that helped. And that's why I say I feel like I'm a product of the government's programs because you could be in Virginia, you could be on Section Eight, and you could be living right in a neighborhood with other homeowners and you know no one would know you get to go to the same school so on and so forth so I think that the government has so many great programs if we take advantage of them you know that that people that are in the inner city programs for the children education all of those things will get you to the next stage but I wanted to be a school teacher the one I wanted to be a school teacher and I told my oldest brother and he told me that no, they don't make enough money. <laughs> so he shot my dreams down. Um, I told my mom I wanted to be a social worker and you know, social workers will take your children from you. So she was like, no, <laughs> no right. like right. you better not. <laughs> right. <laughs> like you, you want to be my enemy. <laughs> right. You take people's children. Yes. So my mother was like, no, you will not be a social worker. So now I hire social workers and I hire all of these professionals to work for me. Oh, that's good. That's good. My sister recently said she's always wanted to be a cafeteria lady. Okay. Yeah. I love said, them. She says she loves it because she get to talk to the kids, right? When they mm -hmm. go to the lines and mm -hmm. you get like, she says, well, which makes a lot of sense. The cafeteria lady is the only one that knows all the kids. Right, right. Because the teachers don't have their classrooms, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes the security guards knows, you know, but I mean, really the cafeteria person sees like, all the kids come through the lines. So she says and, she can interact with all of the kids. The and Eric, school. Eric, that's such a beautiful person to be because I still remember the cafeteria. We all remember our cafeteria yes. ladies, right? Because the days you don't have money, you know, right. they let 
go yeah or they make sure you get your favorite milk because i right. didn't like chocolate i i never i don't like chocolate so she made sure i got my milk and i didn't have See? to have chocolate milk and right. you know all of those things and so that act of kindness it just makes right. your day so much easier but right. i got a top one i got one to top for you uh, okay our custodian at our school mm -hmm. was amazing. Like mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. the students knew him. Yes, Mr. Porter. Mm -hmm. He like really took that school. I mean, anything that happened, you you knew Mr. Porter was gonna tell. <laughs> well, that's what I, I yeah I brought up I brought up custodian. They're they're also very well known. Yes, like Mr. Porter is gonna tell if you misbehave. And then when you get to high school, it's the security guards that you know. Right. Right. That's and that's the other thing I was like most likely not to succeed <laughs> in <my> school. <laughs> really? I I don't believe that. I'm telling you, go go look it up. <laughs> I don't believe it. Go I look would it. look it up, but I know you won't tell me the year, so we're gonna leave it alone. <laughs> we're gonna leave that alone. So listen, let's we're wrapping up here. I know um the people probably you know they're there's still left a lot of questions and we only get I only get one hour to talk to you. So I know you've got a bunch of stories to share and, and tell and we're going to, have to save that for another time to come back because i know in that 19 year journey i mean there's a lot of more oh my. That, yes. in that that we can't possibly cover in this time frame but again i want to be mindful uh, of your time and, and also people listening to this so, so just share some parting words for folks out there any quotes that have helped you or touched you along the way sayings things like that that Again, we'll, we'll turn, this will be your motivational part to give back. <laughs> right? yes, believe it or not, believe it or not, um, 50 Cent's book, the, uh -huh. the Hustle Harder, mm -hmm. that really touched me. He has a lot of quotes like in the beginning of each chapter. Mm -hmm. And some of them are like, you know, be the first person to arrive at the office. And I remember when I worked for l &E, I would even, oh my, you have the book. Well, I have, so I have the oh, 50 yeah, you blog. Have that. <laughs> this one has a lot of quotes in it from mm -hmm. this one. I have the Hustle Harder. I have that one on Audible book. But that Hustle Harder, it have just- Have you read this blew. one? I read some of it. I didn't read the whole book. Okay. But, but the Hustle Harder really touched me because he went through the bankruptcy. He went through so much and he was able to overcome all of it. And it just- really motivated me. The other person that motivated me a lot was um, Tyler Perry, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. He said that, you know, hold on to your business because your dream and your company is like an answer to somebody else. It's tied up into somebody else's dream or somebody else's uh, vision and their life. And it's true because had Mr. Bing of l and &E not had his business, I wouldn't be here today. And he in, in that company, it put out so many entrepreneurs that are government contractors to this day, mm. big time government contractors. We were young, we were vibrant and we worked for him. And he wanted us to become entrepreneurs. He didn't hold us back. And then like the, you know, retired Colonel Deborah Scott Thomas, if she didn't have her business, if she didn't have that dream, I wouldn't be in a position. I wouldn't have been here. And so she would always say, your success is my success. And so it's true. And so I wanna be the Lindbergh Bings and the Deborah Scott Thomas of the world and help other young entrepreneurs to live their dreams. And whatever that may be, if, if it's not government contracting, whatever it may be, but at least you can look to me and say, Roberta was there, she did it, you know, and I can do it too. Wow, that's great. How does someone reach you? Website. Email What's your or, website? Oh, it's www.amore.com. A M O O R E R.com. And you can reach me at info at amora.com. I'm going to share that site real here. Um, if you're leaking, it's A M O O R E R.com. You got it. Um, you're also on LinkedIn as well. Yes. Okay. And just give us that email address one more time. And we'll have it, we'll have it on our notes page, but just for people that, um, Okay, it's info uh -huh. at Amora, A-M-O-O-R-E-R.com. Okay. So Amora is Roberta Moore. So I took the A 
at the end of Roberta and I put it at the beginning of Moore. And I took the R from the beginning of Roberta and I put it at the end of Moore. So that's how you got Amora. Ah. <laughs> and I, I mean, I don't know if we're still recording, but I said, I'm like Tina Turner, that the only thing I got was my name. So this is, this is not my name. This is his name. <laughs> so I kept my name. <laughs> have three more boys all right no that's great that's great no listen uh, thank you thank you so much for sharing your story coming on i would love to get into more details with you on a future episode i really i i am um, i'm more the guy that's interested in, the, in the, the stories of not just the rise but you know the other side of the coin um like i said i have my own story that i experienced and we have a lot of things in common i went through a million dollar lawsuit uh, i rose did millions of dollars came back down was sued and so um we share a lot of similarities and and one of the things that uh jim rome says is if you know if you're gonna get millions of dollars you better become a millionaire and meaning that your mindset your habits your activities and all those other things and that's what i hear you talk that's what I, I hear when you hear like the 50 cent talk that's what you are you're becoming that person that's ready to receive that um and so you know that's kind of where we all were at and now we're coming back into that that second round, so to speak, yes. or some people third round. Um, but yeah, definitely, it, 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 like you said, necessity will make <laughs> allow you to do some really creative things. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I, and I would love to hear all about your creative things that you did. What, okay. uh, you know, this is your, this was your warm up. I know. And it does take me some time to warm up. So thanks. It's, it's your warm up. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate it. And thanks for being on here. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. All right. Take care. You too.